Mary Leger. I'm the liturgist for this service this morning. Although I can't see you, I am so happy to welcome everyone who is participating in this Palm Sunday service. It's wonderful that our friends, old and new, near and far, can come together virtually to share our prayer at this time. We are not alone. Our spirits are one in this sacred time, and we carry that oneness with us. I want to remind you that we will be celebrating communion during this service. Please have bread and wine equivalents close at hand. Now, please join me in the responsorial call to worship. On Palm Sunday, so many years ago, the people saw Jesus and asked, Who is this? So, in worship, we respond. In worship, we declare, Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. Jesus is our teacher and preacher. Jesus is a miracle worker and healer. Jesus is our source of love. Jesus is our path in the wilderness. So may we lay down our hearts like they laid down their coats. Let us worship holy God. Please now join me in our communal prayer. Gracious God, 
On Sunday, the city of Jerusalem cheered for you. They laid down coats and palms for you. They shouted Hosanna and called you king. But on Friday, they abandoned you. On Friday, they yelled, crucify him. On Friday, you were alone in the wilderness. God, we want to be Palm Sunday Christians, but we know all too well that we also are the Good Friday crowd. So today we ask for forgiveness. Forgive us for the moments when we deny you and your message of love. Forgive us for preventing the spread of the gospel. Forgive us our sins. Amen. Though we have fallen short, God reaches out to us in loving forgiveness. God's steadfast love endures forever. No matter what you are going through, no matter what difficulties you face, know that you are loved deeply by God. God is with you, celebrating this day, and walking all the way to the cross with you. Peace be with you. Happy Palm Sunday, Pilgrims. Happy Palm Sunday, Pilgrims. Peace be with you. Hosanna from the Dales. Peace be with you. Peace to all my dear friends at Pilgrim Church in Oak Park, Illinois, and want to just send our greetings to you as we're all in this difficult situation together, and want to share also great memories of being at Pilgrim, making the donuts. Uh, Oak Park was a great place for us and for our family, and we are always just eternally grateful for the great experience. And just wish peace uh, for everybody in the Pilgrim family, and pray that God's spirit rests upon all of you uh, as we go through this crisis together. It's really a time for us to be the church. So blessings. And the peace, peace of Christ, Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you from sunny Florida. We miss you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Hello, this is Cleo, and I'm wishing you the peace of Christ in this, the most unsettling of times. The peace of God open us to his spirit and her spirit that we may be able to restore the earth, that it can breathe more easily and, and nourish humanity, that it can live more meaningfully. Amen. Hey everyone, this is Jen. And this is James. We just wanted to wish everyone peace and hope that you and your families are safe. Bye. Bye. Peace, peace be, with be with you. Good morning. I call all the children of the congregation forward. Today we're going to take a look at a picture. Can you tell me what this is a picture of? That's right. It's a picture of a dog. Now if you look a little closer, do you see what the picture is made up of? That's right. It's made up of words. Do you see the word bark? Adopt? That's right. I see the word friend also. Oh, and I do see crazy. That's in there too. Those are all parts of what makes a dog a dog. And in this case, it actually makes the picture of the dog. So much that if we took away the words, it would look like this. That's right, a blank piece of paper. So in today's scripture, a lot of people are gathered around Jesus for a parade, a party, a celebration. But the interesting part is, most of them didn't really know who Jesus was. A few thought he was a king. A few more thought he was a prophet. Others wondered why they were even having a parade for him. Why was there so many different stories? Because most of them had only seen Jesus from a distance. They hadn't been up close and heard his stories and heard his words. Kind of like that picture in the beginning where up close we could see the words really well and know it was a dog. But from far away, we couldn't tell at all what it was. So how do we get to know Jesus better? We listen to his stories, we hear his stories, we share them with others, 
And by being closer to Jesus, we get to know more about who Jesus is and what he was teaching us. Sort of like this. See the words that make up Jesus' name? I see loving and neighbor. That's right, life. Teacher, that all starts to form a picture in our head, doesn't it? So the more we know Jesus and hear his stories, we have a better understanding and a closer relationship with Jesus and with God. One more thing. I was wondering, what would it look like if our names were put up? What words would describe Anaya or Charlie or Zaylin or Carter? What would that look like? I wonder. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for all the words and stories about what Jesus said and did. Thank you for letting us know Jesus better. And by knowing him better, we get to know you better. Tethered donkey with her coat standing beside her. 
untie them and lead them back to me. If anyone questions you, say, the rabbi needs them. Then they will, then they will let them go at once. This came about to fulfill what was said through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, your sovereign comes to you without display, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So the disciples went off and did what Jesus had ordered. They brought the donkey and her colt, and after they laid their cloaks on the animals, Jesus mounted and rode toward the city. Great crowds of people spread their cloaks on the road, while some began to cut branches from the trees and lay them on the path. The crowds, those who went in front of Jesus, and those who followed were all shouting, Hosanna to the heir of the house of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Most High. Hosanna in the highest. As Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred to its steps, demanding, Who is this? And the crowd kept answering, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. A word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Today's scripture from the Gospel of Matthew begins on the Mount of Olives, where according to the prophet Zechariah, God was to begin the first battle against the nations and inaugurate a new creation. We remember that from Jesus' birth, the Gospel writer has been clear that Jesus is king. And indeed, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph had to flee to Egypt in order to avoid being killed by Herod. So as Jesus choreographs his entry into Jerusalem, he is entering not just as a prophet or a human political figure. He is claiming his authority as king of all creation. The coronation parade into Jerusalem is an unmistakable challenge to Caesar. Jerusalem was the former capital of Israel and Judah, and the current regional capital from which Caesar's representative, the prefect Pontius Pilate, governs. For many centuries, Jerusalem had been a city of both hunger and hope, always recalling its past glories and its future promise. The people of the city fondly remember heroic King David, the great leader who ruled in justice and peace. And they longed once again for a king who would restore them to these former glories. However, their more recent history has been one of living under the heel of one oppressive, violent empire after another. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, and now Rome. The Romans extracted heavy taxes from the people, stationed troops overlooking the temple itself to keep a kind of peace in the city, and chose from the people a few collaborators to keep things running smoothly in a land so distant from the center of the empire. The situation in Jerusalem and the countryside was not good. Many people were drowning in debt. A high foreclosure rate on the land concentrated wealth in the hands of a few, and most people were hungry, jobless, and desperate. The people long for relief, eagerly anticipating that someone, somebody will come to save them from this life-draining existence. It is within this context that Jesus plans his approach to Jerusalem to resemble the arrival of conquerors and kings throughout the Mediterranean world. If the people of Jerusalem are following the script, they should come out to meet him on the way outside the gates of the city, petitioning for peace and pledging their obedience in hope of the king's benevolence. Jesus makes his way towards Jerusalem, and, as expected, the crowds come out to greet him, hailing him as David's son, shouting the words of Psalm 118, a psalm of thanksgiving of deliverance from enemies and celebration of God's steadfast love. Jesus enters the city as if he is claiming it as his own, as the near at hand reign of God. When, as the prophet Isaiah says, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, 
Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The prophet Micah speaks these same words, but he adds, they shall all set under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. This is what they have been hoping for, waiting for, praying for. But it isn't happening exactly as they were expecting. Traditionally, the triumphant military leader would, have, would not have come non-violently on a humble donkey to cut off the chariot, war horse, and bow. Rather, he would have come riding a chariot and war horse and wheeling a bow or other weapons. That is the sort of entry Pilate made each year into the Jerusalem the days before Passover to remind the pilgrims that Rome was indeed in charge. Jesus' entry, though, was the exact opposite. He doesn't ride a stallion or a mare. He rides, in fact, the most unmilitary mount imaginable, a humble donkey with her little coat trotting along beside her. Highly visible symbolism that his kingship was going to be nothing like what they had ever experienced before, and maybe had not even dared to dream of as possible. So while the arrival of Jesus was undeniably good news for those who had been eagerly anticipating a change in government leadership, they were faced with an unexpected decision. What to do with a Messiah who ushers in a reign of peace, not warfare? That wasn't really what some folks had in mind, so their expectations were disappointed. They wanted a different kind of glory, a king who would rise up against Rome. Jesus, you might say, did not fulfill popular expectations. He messed with their preconceived notions of how a good leader behaves and what a just peace looks like. This led some in the crowd to adjust their expectations, opening themselves to new possibilities, new ways of being, new opportunities to live more fully in concert with others and with God. For others, the dissonance between their expectations and reality was too great, leading them to the very human instinct to take over when we think God will not adequately meet our expectations creating barriers to belief in new ways of being, leading, and achieving peace, eventually distancing themselves from the person of Jesus, his teachings, his message of God's grace and love available to all. The good news is that God is steadfast in God's love for all, regardless of which crowd the people of Jerusalem found themselves in, at the end of this holy week endures. God is good all the time, all the time God is good. Thanks be to God that nothing we do can change that. In this time of stress and challenge in our world, many of us are frustrated by delayed plans, uncomfortable limitations, unexpected loss of freedom and control. We had reasonable expectations of what this spring would be like and are disappointed that many of these expectations will not be fulfilled. There are, in fact, once-in-a-lifetime moments that won't happen as planned. So what are we to do? Some of it we can let go of easily. And in fact, some are finding that during this time they are making new discoveries about the things that are essential to their joy as they have more time and less space. But other things that don't go as we expected are significant and may leave wounds that are not easily healed. How do we handle the disappointment, the need to change and adapt our expectations to the emerging reality? There are no easy answers, and the answers that best suit some of us won't necessarily work for all of us. But we all can and should take comfort in knowing that we are not alone. God is always with us, 
And God is big enough and strong enough to carry our anger, our sadness, and our deepest heartfelt grief. I encourage you to take it to the Lord in prayer. Pray in whatever way works for you, with or without words, alone or with others, perhaps mostly listening and resting in God's care. I also encourage all of us to keep reaching out to each other, being there for each other. Sometimes as the little boy who was afraid of the late night thunderstorm cried out to his father, I know God loves me, but right now I need someone who has skin on. Each of us has the opportunity to be that comforting presence with skin on for another, even if we have to do it virtually, with a phone call, on Facebook, on Zoom, or even a snail mail letter or card. As we prepare to enter Holy Week, may Matthew's story of Palm Sunday continue to challenge us. Today, how may God be calling you, calling us, to let go of our preconceived notions, adapt our expectations, and follow Jesus' way for such a time?
Please join me now in an attitude of prayer. God of the universe, you came into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, not on chariots of fire. You came to serve and not be served. You came to deliver the good news of God's great love for us. Grant us a sense of your peace, which passes all understanding. For the world, we pray, that we may be good stewards of its resources, that we would care for Earth and be advocates for change where change is needed. For the nations of the world, we pray for our leaders, that they would seek to do justice, advocate for the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the other, and work towards your righteousness. We pray that those on the front lines of fighting the spread of COVID-19 and curing those afflicted stay safe and healthy. Please give them wisdom, stamina, and patience. For our community, we pray that you would allow us to be agents of change, a place of refuge and a light in the darkness. We lift up names of those of whom we are mindful. Brenda, Delena, Flora's family, Debbie, Connie, Eunice, Pat, Hope, Dorothy, Dr. Ted Jennings' family, Brendan, Myra. God grant that all those named and unnamed may recognize your presence in their lives. Even during times of trial, when it feels like we are walking in the darkest valley, Lord, remind us that you are with us, that you call us to love with our whole being, and when we love our neighbors, we love you, and we find new strength to carry on. This holy week, as we remember your life, death, and resurrection, Help us also to experience your love in new ways and to share that love with the world. In your name we pray. Amen. God tells us over and over in the Bible not to be afraid. Our gifts this morning are one way that we trust God even in a world that keeps telling us to be afraid. We let go of thinking that we are on our own and live each day in graceful dependence on God. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise. There are several ways you can send your offering. Personal check, bank check, or at pilgrimoakpark.org slash gift. Loving God, as hosannas fade to cries of despair, may these gifts be used for peacemaking that settles strife and justice seeking that creates all good hope. Amen. For Holy Communion this morning, I invite you to lend Christ your table. On the first day of Holy Week long ago, people throughout Judea arrived at the dusty gates of Jerusalem primed with Hosanna in their hearts, and Jesus asked to borrow a donkey. On the Thursday that followed, Jesus rented or was given Mark's mother's upper room to celebrate the Passover with the disciples. 
On the afternoon of the resurrection, Jesus was invited into a house in Emmaus and used the bread of that hospitality to break and bless. Lend Jesus your table, your bread, your cup, and your heart. As the disciples told the person who loaned the donkey, the Lord has need of it.
We are one in Christ in the cup we share. Please join me now in our prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray in thanksgiving for this meal of grace, rejoicing that by the very method of our worship, we have embodied the truth that Christ's love is not limited by buildings made with human hands, nor contained in human ceremonies, but blows as free as the Spirit in all places. Spirit of Christ, you have blessed our tables and our lives. May the eating of this bread give us courage to speak faith and act love, not only in church sanctuaries, but in your precious world. And may the drinking of this cup renew our hope, even in the midst of pandemic. Wrap your hopeful presence around all whose bodies, spirits, and hearts need healing. And let us become your compassion and safe refuge. Amen. Please join me in singing the hymn, When Peace Like a River, and we'll sing verses 1 and 4. to share this week. The first one I am most excited to announce that on Monday we will welcome Reverend Colin Knapp as our new senior pastor. Please read his letter of welcome to us in the April Tidings newsletter, which can be found on our website. It is a challenging time to start a new role given the necessity of maintaining a healthy social distance, but I know that he has plans to engage with as many of us as quickly as possible via Zoom, phone calls, etc. In fact, your first opportunity will be during our Good Friday service this coming Friday at 7.30. Our current plan is to live stream a beautiful Tenembri service designed and led by Colin. You will find the links to join us on our website. Our traditional 24-hour Easter vigil will begin at 8 a.m. on Sunday, April 11th, and conclude at 9 a.m. Easter morning. Please sign up for an hour to sit at home and sing or read or meditate or contemplate as we approach Easter. You will find a link to the Sign Up Genius on the Easter Vigil event notice on our website. Our Resurrection Sunday worship service will be held online next Sunday at 11 a.m. where Renap will be leading worship and preaching. I hope that you will all be able to join us on this joyous occasion as a new chapter begins at Pilgrim. And immediately following worship today, you are all invited to join us for this week's virtual coffee hour via Zoom. Leslie Lauderdale and Neil Harriet will be our hosts. You will find the instructions for joining this online event on our website. 
Lord, as we have entered Jerusalem with you, be with us all in the Jerusalems we will be facing. Guide our steps, encourage our hearts, give us abundant faith to follow you. Amen. Good morning, Pilgrim. We're so glad that you could be with us today. Um, some of you know that I have decided that this is the year of gratitude. And under that heading, I want to thank Gloria Cox for all the wonderful things that she has done for us. Some of you know that this is her last Sunday being our uh, interim pastor, and we just are so grateful for all the things that she's done for us. And um, in that venue, we're going to have several folks thank Gloria in their own special way. And I know the rest of you will reach out to her and thank her for all the things that she's done. And we're so glad, Gloria, that you, you were here with us during this really difficult time and helped make the transition um, to our new senior pastor much, much better. Thank you so much, Gloria. Gloria, thank you so much for serving as part-time intentional interim pastor at Pilgrim. You, you brought huge gifts as an administrator and as a preacher. If you continue this career path, some other church will be just lucky and blessed to get you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your caring. Just thank you. Thanks for everything you've done as our pastor, Gloria, and sorry about texting you during church that one time.